All right. Happy Thursday, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We have an absolute powerhouse with us today, and we cannot wait to hear from her and pick her brain. But first, my name is Andrew Whip, and I'm the lead creative and editor at Green Buzz Agency. I'm also joined today by my great friend and colleague, Amelia Oliver, the marketing strategist of Green Buzz Agency. Amelia, how are you today? I'm doing super well, Andrew. Thanks for that intro. I can't wait for today's presentation. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm excited as well. But as a quick aside, if any of our audience members ended up here and don't know who we are or what we do, Green Buzz Agency is a full service video production company that's based out of Old Town Alexandria. We specialize in documentary and motion graphics and branded content. So if you or your teams are curious about the process of making a video or are looking to tell your own story, don't hesitate to reach out. But bringing it back around, today's webinar is the 15th in our Green Buzz Agency webinar series, which was created to connect our community with thought leaders who can help us break down top line strategy, best practices, and advice during the pandemic. And if you'd like to check out any of our previous episodes, feel free to visit greenbuzzagency.com forward slash blogs. And there you'll be able to see a lot of the on-demand recordings of all the episodes, which include strategies and different ideas from executives at Twitter and Quibi, PBS, Sotheby's, Make-A-Wish, tons more. So today we'll be focusing on how to balance exploration and exploitation. So if you're looking to boost your creativity in this confusing time, then you are absolutely in the right place. So in terms of our panelists today, we are joined by Jessica Nordlander. Jessica is the COO of Thought Exchange. Prior to joining Thought Exchange, Jessica served as the Chief Digital Officer for Global Travel Group, STS Education, and was the Head of Business Development at Google in the Nordic countries. She was recently named Sweden's most innovative leader and brings over a decade of experience scaling multinational tech companies. Thank you, Jessica, for swinging by today. Thank you for sharing your insights and experiences with us. We are both really looking forward to getting into the weeds with you. So let's jump right in, pass it over to you. Thanks guys, it's great to be here. So what we're gonna be talking about today is how to balance exploration and exploitation. And I'm gonna start with kind of exploring those concepts a little bit more for anyone in the audience who isn't familiar with them. So usually when we talk about organizational strategies, we talk about companies needing to do two things. You need to figure out how to make money today and then you need to figure out how to make money in the future. And making money today is about exploiting your existing ideas and your existing business models. So being as efficient as possible as you're trying to do those things. And making money in the future is about exploring new things, new ideas and new business models and engaging in innovation. So during exploitation, you use your existing knowledge to enhance organizational efficiency. And during exploration, companies search for new knowledge, develop new products and services for emerging customers and markets, and enhance their innovation performance. And the successful balancing of these two is often referred to as organizational ambidexterity. So the ability to both be efficient and innovative at the same time. And what we're going to explore today is that this is not as easy as it looks like on this slide. It kind of looks like this is like an easy thing. You just you need to, you know, engage in enough exploitation to, you know, make you viable today. And then you need to just explore enough to be viable in the future. As it turns out, this isn't so easy, both because of something called efficiency bias that we're going to dig into a bit more in detail, but also because innovation requires creativity and requires a willingness to fail. And I think especially in times like these, when you know, the crisis mode is full on for a lot of people, and, and often we go into this you know, survival brain stage where we tend to not be able to access the creative parts of our minds, companies and individuals tend to lean even further into exploitation or efficiency and just exploiting your existing ideas versus being able to kind of transform and break free and actually innovate to, to be able to survive under these new conditions. So we're gonna talk a little bit how you as a leader can move your entire organization out of this exploitation state and into an explorative state, both in an organizational but also on an individual level. So organizational ambidexterity, why is this important? Well, this has been connected to things like technological innovation, organizational learning, competitive advantage, and even organizational survival. So as it turns out, companies that are very good at playing this balancing game of these two ends up being the companies that survive, you know, both when times are good, but especially when times get really difficult. 
And even though, you know, this looks easy on the slide that you just need to balance these two, even companies that are pretty good at this often ends up over indexing on exploitation. So usually what happens with the scale is that it tips over in the, in the advantage of exploitation. And often it's because it's just a muscle we know how to use. We've been working this muscle for a long time and we're gonna talk a little bit about that later as well. So when we talk about organizational ambidexterity, we talk about it at two levels. We talk about the choices between exploitation and exploration oriented activities on an organizational level. So this is on a company wide level, right? And then we talk about contextual ambidexterity. And this is choices made by individuals in their day to day and how they manage a trade off between exploitation and exploration oriented activities in their daily work. And just to put this into context, one example of structural ambidexterity is the creation of innovation labs in companies. So you have this difficulty in balancing efficiency and innovation. And often when innovation lives within companies, it gets eaten up by this constant drive for efficiency, which means that you try to then chop off an innovation part of the company and have them live completely separate so that no one else can kind of touch them to make sure that they're actually protected from the rest of the company and the rest of the company's willingness to be efficient. So that's an example of, of trying to create structural ambidexterity. Contextual ambidexterity, probably the best and most well-known example here is Google's 20% time. So here you're allocating 20% of every individual's time towards innovation activities. And this is a way of creating contextual ambidexterity meaning that you're four days a week, every individual focuses on making your current work as good as possible. And then you have one day a week when you work on whatever you want that is innovative and maybe ex more explorative in nature. So that should give you an idea of, of when we work towards ambidexterity, we need to take both of this, these things into consideration. The challenge is though, as I talked about before, as we try to achieve those things, both structural ambidexterity and contextual ambidexterity, we come up against something that I'd chosen to call efficiency bias or, or efficiency creep. And when you look at research on ambidexterity, you can see that when we're given a choice, we choose efficiency. So this efficiency creep mechanism creates a bias for efficiency rather than innovation oriented investments and activities. And as I said before, I think this comes from this knowing, this is the muscle we know how to use. So the way that we've built our organizations over time, it, it, a lot of it comes from the decades of building economies of scale. You know, the biggest company becomes the most successful one because they can reach economies of scale. And economies of scale is built on reducing waste, right? So if you can manufacture a lot of products that look the same and you can build super efficient processes around being able to do so, you're likely going to reach those economies of scale and be successful. And that's probably going to give you a competitive advantage, especially during a time when things didn't change so much. Because that's the other kind of factor in that balancing act between efficiency and innovation. If the future looks quite similar to your current situation, then you know, efficiency is pretty likely to make you successful both in the present and in the future. But if the future is very different from the current state, then efficiency might lock you into these processes that actually are really, really hard to break out of to be able to change in the future. So depending on how much you assume that your future will be different from today, you probably need to over-index more on exploration versus exploitation when you try to reach that dynamic balance. And this is true both as we talked about on an organizational level. So an example of efficiency bias is shutting down innovation labs because they aren't able to, to show immediate business impact, right? You have an innovation lab for a year and after a year, that group hasn't been able to prove any immediate business impact, so you shut them down. Well, if you are proving immediate business impact in your current state, what you're probably doing is you're working with continuous improvement or, or building efficiencies into your system, right? So shutting down an innovation lab because it isn't able to prove, prove immediate business impact seems like a, a paradox, right? The same thing happens on an individual level. Even when I worked at Google, it was pretty common that people tried to take their 20% time and allocate towards their normal work. Just because every system that we've built in the organization is built on incentivizing people and promoting people and paying people more based on how they do in their core role. 
So we actually had to figure out how to protect that time and make sure that people didn't allocate it towards just working on their normal things. So both on an organizational and an individual level, this bias is very strong. And what I've seen is that it gets even stronger in the times of crisis. So for example, when an organization, you know, is starting to have cash flow problems, usually what happens is that you chop off all the innovation related activities and you just try to focus on your current survival, right? And the same thing happens on an individual level. When individuals go into crisis mode, you shut down and you focus on the things that you know, you get less likely to take risk which also impacts, usually impacts creativity. And this is what's happening in organization, a lot of organizations right now. So the interesting thing then is like, so how do you then trigger innovation? Well, it turns out that there is a few things in research that have been proven to be able to create innovation. And the interesting thing is that if you think about efficiency as reducing waste, so you want to get rid of waste. You don't want to be wasteful with any of your resources. One of the core elements of making innovation happen is Slack. And Slack is a concept that is defined as the cushion of resources that is available beyond any minimum requirement to get the job done. And if you take that down to the individual level, any resource that's made available in excess to what's necessary for that individual to deliver on their job role accomplishments. So waste, right? under the definition of efficiency. Like you have too much resources compared to what you need to actually get the job done. And that turns out is exactly what's needed to make innovation happen. And now I think you can see how that balancing, why that balancing becomes so difficult because the efficiency bias is trying to remove all the waste that exists in the systems. And in order for innovation to happen, there needs to be some cushion of resources in the system. It gets even trickier because it's not a linear relationship. So it's not that the more excess resources that you have, the more innovation will happen. That's not the case. So too much slack actually can trigger complacency and pet projects and, and any, everything like that. So you can't give everyone all the slack in the world and expect that you will get all the innovation in the world, right? There needs to be some balancing where still, you know, ideas can thrive and you don't inhibit innovation since you're discouraged any type of experimentation whose success is uncertain. And then the other side, as, as I said, it fosters complacency if you over-indexed on this. So this is why this becomes even harder to actually know how much slack should we be, be allocating. But as I said before, when you think about this as an organization or as an individual, the more different you think that the future is going to be compared to today, probably the more you need to over-index on the experimentation to ensure your future viability. Also, the funny thing about slack is that often we think about slack as time, right? It seems like we always have too little time. And that's why we can't be creative or can't be innovative because we just have too much to do with our normal stuff that we need to get done. Both at work and at home, we have too many kids that need to get picked up. We have a house to clean. You know, we, we have dogs to walk. We have tasks that need to be done at work. So often we see time as a limiting factor, but actually there's several other types of, of resources that we can think about resource allocation around to make sure that we create, um, create room for, for innovation and creativity. So I'm gonna take four different examples here. Technological Slack, Knowledge Slack, Support Personnel Slack, and Time Slack. Technological Slack, if you look at the definition of this, it's defined as a cushion of functionalities given to any organizational user that goes beyond the certain functionality that are necessary for doing his or her job. So for example, this could be to have more access to more powerful tools than you actually need to do your job. So for example, giving your backend developers access to front-end tools and vice versa, right? They don't need it to get the minimum job requirements done, but innovation is more likely to happen if they have it. Or giving everyone, you know, more computing power than they actually need to get the minimum job done. This sounds super wasteful, right? And super expensive. And again, this is the trade-off, right? Everything sounds wasteful and expensive, but in order for innovation to happen, those things need to be available. Knowledge Slack this is actually one of my favorites. So this is defined as the degree to which user knowledge goes beyond the step-by-step -step procedural knowledge necessary to be followed to do his or her job. I imagine that a lot of people have been involved in a recruitment process where the expression overqualified has been thrown around. Hiring someone with more knowledge than you need to get the job done 
sounds super expensive and wasteful, right? Like why would we hire someone that knows so much more than what we need to get this job done? Turns out that knowledge can actually work as Slack and the likelihood of someone being able to innovate is actually higher if there's some level of knowledge Slack involved. So I think about that, you know, the next time we're trying to make a hire or it's also a pretty efficient way of beating ageism, for example, in the workplace, because it turns out knowledge Slack is a thing. Support personnel Slack. So this is conceptualized as a cushion of support personnel surrounding an organizational user that are beyond what's optimally necessary by a user for doing his or her job. So you can take an example here. So let's say you're trying to drive innovation in a business unit around in digital innovation, for example. If the people in these business units are able to access, for example, a higher degree of IT support or technical support than they need for minimum job accomplishments, the chances of them being able to innovate increases. So again, no, it's not a linear relationship. It's not a justification for all of you to go back and demand like this personal IT support person to be kind of attached to your hip to intervene every time that little spinning ball of death starts going on your Mac. But you know, it's, it's actually true that if you have support personnel Slack, you will be able to innovate better. And then there's of course time Slack. So this is defined as a user's cushion of time for doing his or her job that's beyond what is optimally necessary for achieving it. So you need to have some extra time on your hand. And the reason to why this one is so intuitive is you probably because you need some of this in combination with some of the others to actually be able to make use of them. So if you're gonna make use of that extra computing power that you've been given, you probably need a little bit of time as well. So if we put all these things into place then, you know, we give people the resources that they need. We create Slack in our organization, both on an organizational and an individual level. Will people then be creative? Well, I think that this is where we need to talk about what happens during a crisis, right? So I've put up what I call a hierarchy of questions here, which is quite similar to, you know, what we discuss when it comes to hierarchies of, of needs or of human needs, right? And depending on where your company is at in the current state, you know, depending on if your organization have trust challenges or at a level of high trust, you're usually able to explore different concepts with the people in your organization. So an organization that is already at a high trust level, you can usually go out and trigger creativity quite easily with people. You can ask people, why do we do what we do or, or what's possible in the future? And people will lean into creativity. Whereas when you have a low trust level in your organization, you probably need to start with asking what's wrong and what can we do to improve to make you happier at work, for example. And I think that this is an important part of, of trying to transform during times like these, because trying to ask about things like culture, vision, innovation, transformation, it will destroy trust in an organization when safety, security, structure, and process are not present. And this is one of the biggest differences that I have seen working with companies during this time, that is the difference between companies that manage to transition into a creative and transformative state versus organizations that aren't. Because a lot of organizations assume that they are at the same level of trust after or during this crisis as they were when they came into it. So if you were at a very high level of trust in your organization and, and you know, the, the willingness to fail and the psychological safety and the, you know, all those things were there in combination with these Slack resources, right? And you were able to unlock creativity in your people. If that was true in February. In April or July or now in October, assuming that you're still there and assuming that people will have that you, your organization will be able to snap out of those efficiency bias because you were in February that's not the case and if you assume that about your organization you will actually not start where you need to start in your work to get back to that creative stage so if you look at this a lot of times you need to restart the process right so even if you were at a high trust and creative state in your organization in February, most organizations have been pushed down in this hierarchy. 
So I can take an example from our organization, which I would say is generally operating in a very high trust state. And we have an organization that is reasonably good at, at innovation. And, and also given that we're a startup, we're sometimes probably a little bit too good at innovation and too, little, too bad at efficiency, but you know, kind of, it's the name of the game. So we had to actually restart and rebuild trust from the ground up to be able to be creative because what happened to people was that even if we had this high level of trust, people started to get worried about losing their jobs, right? People started worrying about their, their you know, loved ones being, becoming sick or started worrying about not being able to visit their grandparents in, in another country or, or in a different part of the country, things like that. Which means that as leaders, we had to walk back down to the bottom of this hierarchy and start over and work ourselves way up, up towards the higher trust states. Which means that I think you can compare this to something that we do on a human level. So if I have a coworker that comes into my room, you know, one, one person, and I can see that they're suffering a bit, probably I wouldn't ask this person, you know, what ideas do you have about where our company needs to go? That would be, you know, very, very inappropriate for me to ask that question because I can see that this person is suffering, right? I would probably need to start with asking the, the question, like, what challenges are you experiencing? and How can I help you, right? And then as this person gets to kind of work through what they're going through, you're probably able to, you know, ask questions like, how could I improve my support for you? And then go to, you know, stages of how can we all support each other? And then once we've gotten to that stage on an individual level, we're probably going to be able to start talking about, you know, what's possible now and through this crisis that wasn't possible before. And I think that a lot of the times we forget that we need to go through this exercise with our entire companies. So our entire companies have been pushed down to the bottom of this hierarchy. And we need to collectively work ourselves up by asking ourselves these questions within the organizations. So to unlock creativity and to go from crisis to creativity, we need to make the resources for innovation available, but we also need to rebuild trust from the bottom up. So how I would summarize that is you need to meet people where they're at. And if you do that, it allows you to transform your organization. And right now, transformation is critical. So the skill set in an organization to actually be able to, to do that transformation from low trust back into the high trust stage is what I see as being the core competence of leaders that manage to, to unlock creativity again in their organizations through this crisis. So I'm going to summarize this presentation and we're going to go to a Q&A. The summary here is that Treat efficiency bias like any other bias. So, you know, I think as humans, we're, we're used to having to deal with, with all of our, you know, various biases all the time, right? And we know, for example, you know, around gender bias is an example that I think that everyone is aware of that often this is unconscious, right? So we're making unconscious choices, not because we, we don't believe in gender equality, but how like the systemic processes that are in place or the systemic thinking that is in place that is triggered unconsciously. And efficiency bias works the same way. If we don't acknowledge efficiency bias, we will make all the decisions in our organizations are going to be colored by that bias. And we're going to be making those decisions looking through that lens. So you need to actively work to address this. And one way to work to actively address this is to allocate Slack, to actually have a Slack strategy in place to be able to, to mitigate efficiency bias. And as we talked about, that needs to happen both at an organizational and an individual level. So as summary point number two here, we need to be aware of both structural and contextual ambidexterity. That if we want to unlock creativity, you need to think about how are we going to allocate resources on an organizational level and how are we going to allocate Slack resources on an individual level to individuals in the organization. And then the last bit we talked about is that we need to figure out how to collectively transition our organizations towards high trust and a more innovative and creative state. So as we talked about, this will happen in one-on-one -on -one conversations. We're usually pretty good at this. We're pretty, pretty good at reading individuals that we're talking to. And I think we all can agree that it would be pretty tone deaf to not meet an individual human where they're at. So what we need to do is that we need to figure out and use tools that can actually help us you know, meet entire organizations of thousands of people where they are at and transition them to a more innovative and creative state. This was all I had today. So I'm, I'm super excited, kind of hand it back over to Andrew and take some questions.
Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for presenting. And I think now would be a great time to transition into the q and I'd like to kick us off with a question that focuses around the balance of all this stuff, which actually was one of your first slides, right? And I would say like one thing that popped into my mind was what if you're worried to allocate Slack because your margin for error gets way lower, like in times of COVID, right? Like on paper, it makes so much sense to have this ambidexterity. On the other end of the spectrum though, if the economy's hurting and your business is really hurting and you're not doing well, it feels like you might not have the luxury of being able to give slack because if you did, your margin for error gets way lower. And if you make a mistake, it could be your last mistake. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think that this is like, I'm going to go back to what I was talking about, like about current viability and future viability, right? right? Efficiency is still incredibly important here because if you can't ensure your current viability, you don't need to care about your future because you, you have no current viability. Exactly. I think that often what we see is that companies care so much about their current viability that they aren't able to ensure their future viability. And that's why we see so much disruption, right? Like why is it so easy for a company to get disrupted by new technology? It's because they've only been focused on their current viability. But when you are in a crunch, I would almost compare this as personal finances. Often it's like what we're doing on a day-to-day basis in our personal finances is that we're making a trade-off between the life that we want to try to live today and for example, saving for retirement. And often if we scrutinize ourselves, we could maybe, you know, not rent that, have that Netflix subscription. And that would allow us to put aside, you know, $9.99 towards retirement savings. So even if your resources are extremely scarce, you can usually find some room. So that's how I usually talk about this with companies that feel like we can't even ensure our future viability or our current viability. Like how could we think about our future? I would encourage that type of thinking. Is there anything that you can carve out today that you can put aside for the future? Yeah, we have a question here from Emily Herman. She asked, what tools can you put in place to rebuild trust? Is that made more difficult by the remote work environment? And I was actually thinking a very similar thing. How does a company even analyze where their company sits on the trust spectrum? The slide you had was very beautifully written out, but I've been at companies that it feels like they're asking all those questions at the exact same time because they don't know where they are. Like maybe a few employees, there's a lot of trust. Maybe a few others, there's not much trust, or maybe they just have no idea really where their company sits on that trust spectrum. How would a company go about figuring that out and what tools can they put in place to rebuild that trust? Yeah, I think that most companies can assume right now that they're pretty low. Like during financial crisis, often people are extremely worried about their jobs. And I think that one thing here I think is super interesting to think about is that we can just look around us in, in like, for example, like the tech space where, you know, where, where I operate, right? Like we've had a lot of tech companies that have for, for years and years now only seen continuous growth, which means that, you know, the only time they laid off people has been if people were underperforming. They've never had to do layoffs, which right. means that it's been very easy to keep this level of trust in terms of like your job is secure, we're paying you well, we have tons of perks in place. But all of a sudden, when you actually hit a financial crisis or a crisis like the pandemic that's we, that we've just been going through, people start worrying. So I think that part of my answer there is I think regardless of where you were before, you are now at a pretty low level because people are worried about their jobs and people are realizing that regardless of how many perks you have in place in your office, I might get laid off. And all of a sudden that changes the power dynamic within your company. Even if you do big layoffs and and with the people that are left, how are you going to trigger creativity and transformational mindset in the people that you have left if you have had to lay off half of your workforce because people are going to get worried. So I think that, I think that right now I would spend less time trying to figure out where I'm at and just assume that most companies are pretty low. Because people personally are suffering right now, which makes it really difficult to be creative. And I think that, you know, this is, of course, a very shameless plug, but this is the companies we work on a daily basis through the Thought Exchange platform. Like Thought Exchange is a platform to actually be able to have these types of scaled conversations that were normally 
used to be having on a one-on-one -on -one situation, right? To actually be able to ask 10,000 people, how could we support you better? And right. be able to have those conversations in a transparent way. But of course, there's also other tools out there that you can use to actually be able to have, you know, scaled conversations about how people are doing and try to make that transition. Yeah, so kind of jumping off of that point there, if you are listening to this presentation or you're thinking about this and you're realizing that you're kind of low on the innovation spectrum, could you just give us some examples of what an innovation activity would look like? And are there any kinds of ways that you could measure the success of that innovation activity? Yeah, I think this is a million dollar question like what what and there's tons and tons of big thinker around this and tons of research around like what is the success of innovation right and usually when you talk about putting metrics in place for innovation you talk about input metrics versus output metrics because if you know if the innovation was successful was it really innovation or was it just continuously improving what you already had if you immediately can tell if it's going to be successful so i guess that what i would normally what i would try to nudge people towards when they allocate resources towards you know true kind of transformative innovation is that it has to do with things you don't know how to do it has to do with business models that you've not yet explored technology that you haven't yet kind of interacted with markets that you've never ventured into right and it's almost impossible in the short term to tell which one of them are successful right you're going to have to have some patience like true innovations require patience patience to explore patience to fail and all those things that we don't allow for in the continuous improvement space because in driving continuous improvement and driving efficiencies in what you are already doing there there's tons of tons of ways of actually judging if the you know what, what you're doing in that space is actually immediately successful so i think that the most important thing here i think is to i find it very useful to separate continuous improvement a lot of people also feel as a type of innovation whereas i'm, I'm a little bit more of like a hardcore person which because if you start calling all continuous improvement innovation then you're going to think you're doing innovation when you're not you're just improving your current viability like for example i think a lot of people talk about digitalization as innovation what well, depends right a lot of automation for example is definitely continuous improvement and that doesn't mean it's bad like continuous improvement is great as we've talked about, we need a massive amount of efficiency and continuous improvement to ensure our, our current viability as companies. But we also need true exploration of what's next. Like self-driving cars or something like solar, you know, those kinds of things that maybe aren't on like a mechanical level. Yeah. And also, like, I think that for companies in general, like, what is our next product? What will our customers be asking about? In, like, what, what kind of companies will come into our space in the future that aren't here today? And what will they deliver to customers that we aren't even remotely close to delivering with our current products and services, right? And I think that this is where, why, again, it's so easy to disrupt mm -hmm. uh, industries today, because companies focus so much on just getting better at what they're already good at. And as I said, again, like, that's not a in itself, it's not a bad thing. You need to do that also. But if you try to disconnect true exploration from continuous improvement, I think you're going to create space for that innovation versus, you know, believing that you're innovating when you're kind of what you're doing is just improving what you already have. It makes sense to me for the product side of things, the innovation, I can more clearly see what that would look like in the examples that you've given so eloquently. What are some examples in the service-based side, like service-based companies? What does innovation look like in that? Is it delving into a new service offering they've never done before, like that kind of a thing? Yeah, it could be that, or I think that the service industry, I think has a lot, uh, lot of work to do on business models. I think right. as a person that continuously talk about innovation, I think it's interesting to look at all service companies that, you know, are still are talking about innovation and are pitching kind of innovation, but they still themselves operate on the same business models that they did started doing a hundred years ago. You charge your customers similar ways as you did a hundred years ago, even though outcomes might be measured completely differently now than they did. And I think in, if you look at, for example, I worked a lot with kind of marketing agency and performance marketing, and there we still starting to see some innovation now, but I th still think we see a lot of kind of retainer based type of business models right. when it's really, really easy to measure performance today. 
So I think that there's in the service industry, I think there's a lot of things to do around business model innovation that I think could be super impactful, which is not just improving your margins on your existing business model. It's actually trying to see, could we go to market with a different business model? Another thing I wanted to ask you about was the contextual ambidexterity to me seems more risky than the structural because mm. you're, it sounds like, you know, you're kind of leaving it up to people to divide their time and their day up appropriately. And I could foresee a problem where you have people who spend more than the 20% you've asked or less, or because they're never really fully attached to it and doing it full time, they kind of half ass it for lack of a better phrase, you know, do you lean toward one more than another? And, and if you do, then, then why? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I guess it come. I think it almost becomes philosophical at that point in believing where good ideas will come from. Do you believe that just because you call a team, the innovation team, they are now the people that, you know, are going to be a, and they have certain credentials, like now that's where good ideas are going to come from in this company. I think that that's a, to me, a pretty limiting way of thinking about people's potential. And I think that if you think about the 20% projects at at Google, for example, and and other companies that kind of have experimenting with a lot of this, you believe that kind of every person in every company will innovate if given access to resources, right? Like that the power of being creative and the power of innovation is exists in every single person that you've hired. Like, I think that you need both, right? I think that you need both, you know, more structured environments because that's usually how an idea can be taken further. So once you've gotten onto a certain path, like usually kind of a more structural innovation lab can take an idea further, but Mm -hmm. to not think that like you would want every single employee in your company to be involved in in innovation, I I think it's a mistake because then you're going to be limited by whoever. And I think that this is one of the reasons to why we still struggle with, with diversity too, right? Like you hire innovation labs where you need certain credentials. Maybe you have had to be an, you know, an entrepreneur before, or you need to have certain patents to your name and those types of things. And, and who are those people? Well, they're usually people with a lot of privilege that have been able to be in those situations before, True. which means yep. that the amount of diversity that we see in those areas is very low. Whereas if exactly. you make kind of employee kind of company wide, Slack resources available, you're likely to get innovation from a much more diverse group of people. Right. I mean, it sounds to me like slightly higher risk and reward on that side. Like you're saying, the benefit could be enormous because you're getting so many more brains on it, so many more different ideas. You're accessing. Yeah, I also the full think it's potential. like I think I think you're mentioning risk, right? Which I think is an interesting concept. What's the risk of not doing it? Like you'll have robot employees that are never have any time to, to be creative. When we keep talking about that, you know, in a lot of the knowledge economy today, human resources are, is the only thing that keeps us competitive. So how do you create an environment where you actually make creativity accessible for the majority of the people that you have in that organization? I would say that, yeah, you say high risk. I, I'm, I, would, I would like to evaluate the risk of, of not you know, at least exploring some of these concepts, right? For sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, risk in terms of, again, going back to what you were talking about earlier, like, are you getting the job done? Not Mm -hmm. even looking at the future. And if you feel like your company might not be there yet, or you you don't have, you feel like you can't afford for even 10% of people's time to be doing anything other than staying afloat. But that just goes back to the assumption of kind of where you sit at with your company and how you feel about it at any given moment. Yeah. And that's what I'm like. I'm not advocating that every company can do 20%. That's the same thing as saying like every human on the planet should put $10,000 a month aside for retirement. It's impossible, right? right? Usually what we talk about when we talk about, you know, personal finances, we talk about a percentage of what you have, right? So try to have you know, one or two or five percent, even if you have very very little, try to save something. And I think that that's the same message that I would like to send to companies. Regardless of how little you have, try to put something aside. So we have a kind of an interesting audience question here that asks, how can you trigger innovation without turning the management of innovative work into just more exploitative work? I, I can see this happening in, in innovation labs, for example, like you set up this innovation lab and then like kind of the reporting and the 
like kind of management of these innovation projects almost turns into like a, an efficiency project, right? Like that's how I'm interpreting this question. It's also something that I've seen happen in reality. Mm -hmm. I think that this is, it comes back to the patience. How long is the innovation patience in our organization? How long are we let, you know, willing to let things live without making them more structured projects or folding them into our existing business model or expecting them to have an ROI. And there I don't think that there's one particular answer. It comes down to, I think, what types of projects there are. And I think that there's a span of them in, in terms of you know, how quickly do we turn them into something that gets folded into a rigorous process and, and how many can we keep at like a playful explorative stage for a long time. And I think some companies are really good at this. I think that some of the big tech companies are extremely good at this, at letting projects live for years without having any idea of like, how will this actually generate us money? And then, you know, you go in and, and you look at like, I don't know, I think that there's a site, I can't remember the, the website now, but there's a site where you can go in and look at all the projects that have been sunsetted within Google. For example, it's an externally facing website where you could look at all of the things that have been built in Google and when they were sunsetted, which I think is, is an example of pretty long innovation patience. Yeah, and kind of shifting gears here, I'm just wondering if you are a company and you're trying to assess your level of slack and ensure you're not inhibiting innovation or fostering complacency if you've over indexed on experimentation, are there any kinds of triggers or signs that would let your organization know you're either in that sweet spot of innovation or, or you're maybe over or under indexing? Yeah, I think that. Again, it's a tricky question to answer in general terms. I think on a, I could almost look at every company independently and judge, but it's difficult to give a general answer because it depends on how are you ensuring your current viability? Like how is your current viability measured? So if you're a startup, usually it's, it's probably cash burn, right? Like how much money are your investors willing to let you burn? which is often your level of efficiency, even if you aren't even remotely profitable. And to me, this is an interesting aspect of this balancing between efficiency and innovation, because often what we've allowed startups to do is that we've allowed them to create a completely new measure of efficiency, because that has always been profitability and gross margins in the past. You know, you would never see a listed company X number of years ago that wasn't profitable and didn't have good gross margins. But what we're seeing now is like we see companies IPO without being profitable. Right. So I think that this, this like measurement of efficiency depends on what the benchmark of efficiency look like, which often for certain industries now is not profitability. It's probably how, how much cash can you get away with burning, whereas other companies needs to maintain maybe certain gross margins or certain levels of profitability. And that's also where this balancing act comes in and why it's always, why you also get this disruption, because I think that a lot of startups are allowed with the help of venture capital to over index on innovation and are allowed more, I'm going to use the word slack, more slack in becoming efficient, which is a reasonably new phenomenon. Yeah. And I mean, another thing that just popped in my head something I've experienced at a lot of different companies I've been at and, and even here at Green Buzz is how do people set concrete goals when they're working in explorative work? The ideas are always actually pretty easy and people have a lot of them when you hold, hold brainstorms and go, how, do, how can we get better? How can we innovate? What can we do differently? So it's awesome that that question is being asked and then we're getting awesome ideas, but then choosing you know, which ones to go with is obviously a business decision. And then from that point, evaluation, I feel like can be really tricky when you're doing like explorative work, because like you said, you got to have patience. It's not like you, you might be able to see differences right away. And if you're a smaller business, I feel like that can get really tricky because how long do you let people go out on a limb to try something out to see if it's working and how do you even evaluate it if it's something extremely new or innovative? And this is, again, like our willingness to evaluate comes from our efficiency bias, right? Like we just can't help ourselves. Like we want to be able to evaluate every single initiative right away. This question is like just an example of like how strong that bias is, right? Because we've just concluded that 
true innovation, we probably don't know exactly how successful it's going to be until years down the road, but we're still, we really, really want to be able to measure it right now, right? And evaluate it right now for its viability. And if we can evaluate it right now for its viability, it's probably continuous improvement. So I think that, I don't know, I read a quote a while ago that said like, I don't know, not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. Mm -hmm. And I think that often what you do, and that there's tons of, you know, more, this is a very deep topic that I don't want to get kind of too entangled in without going into it in more detail. But often what you do with innovation is that you focus on input metrics versus output metrics. So how many ideas generated, how many ideas MVP'd, how many ideas prototyped. Like right. you try to focus on actually have building a pipeline instead of evaluating the, the exact quality of all the ideas that are coming out. So then th there's tons of stuff we could dig into here. This is like, we talk, we talk an hour only about this, but often that's where company, and there's tons of good kind of materials to read on this too, because there's so many kind of thinkers and research going on on this, but often we talk more about input metrics than output or outcome metrics, in your because those might take years. Right. And in your experience, like, did a place like Google or other places you've been at, did they set goals when they asked people to be innovative and take a portion of their time or were the innovation no. labs... No, like, well, on the innovation labs, like there, there were for sure those types of metrics. But if you look at the kind of the contextual ambitics there, you know, on the individual level, the only thing more or less that was measured that was that you had to do it, which is right. a typical input metric, right? You have to spend the time, but we don't care at all what you spend it on. So you so, just, you just weren't, you had to disclose or report your 20% project, but it didn't matter what it was. Gotcha. Or maybe where it was even headed. No, no. So if five years down the line, my employee, Andrew, now I'm like, Hey, you've been putting 20% of your time aside. I know what you've been working on, but there's literally been, you know, nothing's resulted from it that they're okay with that. Like a company yeah. like Google would be okay with that. Yeah. And also like they are, I don't have the full story on this. I'm not sure how true it is, but it, they, they allocate, like they say that Gmail started as a 20% project. Yeah. I've heard that too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure if that well. is actually true or not, but you know, there, there are many examples like that. And I, I think that often what, you know, what, for example, what the 20% project looks like for me, for example, was that I just had an idea and I just went and knocked on the door of a completely different department than I never, ever worked with before. And said like, hey, I was thinking about this. Maybe we could do something like this together. And they were like, oh, that's great. Like, yeah, we've been looking for some more resources to be able to explore this. Like, yeah, that's, that's perfect. We'll have this person now one day a week to be able to kind of investigate this thing or whatever, right? So yeah, there was no, no outcome, you know, output metrics, only input metrics. Gotcha. And in terms of the organizational workflow, when you're doing something like a 20% project, is everyone on your team working on that 20% on the same day of the week or is it kind of at your own rhythm because something that we internally have been talking about is this concept of deep work and not being available during certain hours of the day so they can truly focus deeply on a cognitively challenging task so and, and we've been thinking about that concept and thinking that it would make sense if organizationally we're all engaging in that deep work phase at the same time so i'm wondering if that's similar for the 20 percent project or you just kind of do that at your own rhythm yeah, I think it depends, again, it depends a little bit on your organization, right? Like I, you know, not knowing exactly, you know, how, how you work, like some companies requires to be like to set those kind of rules top down, right? And, and some companies, I think, are more saying that as an individual, I imagine that you wouldn't choose to take this 20% time at a time when it becomes incredibly disruptive for your team. I think that that was more the approach at Google. Like, yeah, I, I assume you wouldn't choose to do this work at a time when everyone else has their Monday meeting. Like that sounds right. like a very bad decision by an individual. So I think it's like depending on, I guess, again, where you're like at with the trust levels. I think that in general, I, I think depending on your workforce, I think you can, you either maybe need to centralize those decisions more, or you can push them out to the individuals and say, like, do the right thing, then see if that actually ends up happening, right? Yeah. And I'm just curious if during COVID, if you either at Thought Exchange or have seen elsewhere, any kind of innovation that's really stuck out to you during this kind of transformative period? Yeah, I think that 
it's a time where I think a lot of companies have started producing things that weren't what they were like perfume, you know, companies that have started producing hand sanitizer, which, you know, probably can't be seen as continuous improvement of what they were doing. And it's probably not like maybe it can be seen as ensuring their current viability, perhaps, but that's a pretty big step, right? And, and in order to be able to kind of get your staff to that mindset, I, I feel that it requires some level of trust in your organization that, yeah, this is actually what we're going to start doing because it's a pretty big leap in terms of who you are as a company and, and your brand and, and what you're trying to do, right? At Thought Exchange, we've actually made some of our, our most interesting kind of future product developments during this time. So in the shift from work from home, we've all of a sudden seen our products be used by our customers in completely different ways, which kind of triggered us in, in actually developing a completely new product line that we probably would have never have accelerated if it wasn't for, for kind of the big shift to working from home. So I think that we've definitely managed to get creative in this time and, and kind of focused on products that, that we would have probably never have focused on if there wasn't for this shift. So I think there's plenty of examples out there, but I think that if you're going to do them, you need that. But even, even for us, I think that we've, like we were, we're a startup, right? Which, and, and often are pretty quick at pivoting and pretty quick at innovating, but I think you can see the, the sentiment in any organization kind of going towards like, shouldn't we be focusing on preserving our resources and shouldn't we be focusing on kind of the things that we know how to do? I, I, I think you can tell in any organization right now that people are anxious. They're anxious that if we don't preserve our resources, we might have to do layoffs. So let's try to preserve resources and be as efficient as we can, because maybe that's the thing that will help us from not having to do layoffs. Whereas really it might be, the best thing you can do to not have to do layoffs is to actually make a transformative change in terms of what you're doing. It's back to that risk concept, right? The risk of changing always feel really high, but often it's the risk of not changing. It's much bigger, but we're just very bad at evaluating that. Yeah. I mean, we've seen so many companies over the years. I think I heard something like the top 20 companies from 20 years ago, only one remains in the top 20. Mm. The other 19 fell out. You think about companies like notorious like Kodak and other companies that didn't really innovate with the times that kind of got left behind Xerox and things like that. Mm. But yeah, I think that might be a great time to stop it there. And I want to thank you for, for coming on here. I think everyone learned a ton today and got some really awesome, tangible takeaways to everyone who joined us. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, we hope you guys had a good time and, and you learned a couple of things along the way and be on the lookout for our next webinar. It's going to be featuring Sarah Lepley, the former supervising producer at Viacom and TJ Cooney, the video producer at AARP. We're going to be chatting about data that fuels storytelling and creative decision-making with tons of hands-on takeaways. So we hope to see everybody there. And again, check out greenbuzzagency.com forward slash blog to see on-demand recordings of any of our previous episodes and finally, an enormous thank you to Jessica again for joining us today. I think that's, that's all we have. So we'll see you all next week.